Welcome everyone. My name is Michael Walsh. I'm a senior adjunct fellow at Pacific Forum. I'm also the chair of the Humanitarian Security Challenges Working Group. Today, we're here to have a discussion on what it's like to be an international search and rescue worker in Taiwan. Our guest is Tao Yun Chen of the International Headquarters SAR Taiwan. I'd like to start off my first question with, what is it like to be a, an international search and rescue worker in Taiwan? Tell us about your experience and about your organization, please. Thank you, Michael, for the invitation. Uh, my work majority is uh, to go search and rescue domestically or international. For example, uh, Taiwan had multiple complex disasters like typhoon, earthquake, mass lights, flooding, shipwrecks, tsunami, and uh, sometimes air crash or ocean disaster and all kinds of uh, disaster we have to do in our mission. And uh, sometimes the disaster is not just one, it's more complicated. It's combined of different kind of the disaster. So that's all our major, major work is to go and uh, search and to rescue them. Yeah. Does the majority of your work within Taiwan or is it overseas? Uh, we do both. For example, uh, in international rescue, we have ever, we have been uh, earthquake in cell El Salvador, or we ever uh, South Asia tsunami, the tsunami in Thailand, the earthquake in Pakistan, a landslide uh, in Philippines, also tropical cyclone in Myanmar, the earthquake in Northeast Japan, the flooding in Malaysia, and the earthquake in Nepal. Of course, uh, recently we've been uh, the earthquake in uh, Turkey and Syria. So as you know, I mean, some of these places are more difficult for an international humanitarian organization to work than others, and for different reasons. And so can you comment a little bit about Myanmar and Pakistan and, and the challenges that you encountered working there? Yes, uh, the challenges, like, for example, uh, when we go to search and rescue mission uh, in Philippines, uh, we face uh, rebel forces, the insurgent troops, but they are polite to us because I think that's because they know we are going to help them. So uh, of, of course the military of the government, they control the area, but we also will face the insurgent troops, but both of, of them are very uh, friendly to us. Yeah, so uh, whenever we go to the disaster area, we have to uh, negotiate with the government commu good communication so that we can do our job best. And do you feel like there, there are more challenges or, or opportunities given Taiwan's status in the international community? Does it, does it help or, or hinder your work or does it do both? Uh, I think every, every time the disaster happened, it, it be a great experience. So uh, what we do is just try our best and learn from every time uh, from the experience internationally. And you probably heard in some of the prior um, discussions that we had with, with other teams that one of the big challenges is access in armed conflicts and in insecure environments. And, and there's been a lot of discussion about how to get access, how to maintain access. When you're planning to do an overseas mission somewhere where there's an armed conflict or an insecure environment, how do you go about assessing the risk and how do you go about mitigating those risks and ensuring that there's access for your teams? If, even though there are no conflicts, 
every disaster area is has certain danger. And so uh, even with conflicts, we will try the best to contact the, the government first, see if we can do anything to help them. And then uh, we will try to do our best and follow the guideline from the government. And whenever we went to the place, there are military, police, and they are control the area. So we will just do our best to co-op with them. And you know, one of the challenges in Syria, since you were talking about Turkey a minute ago, was the fact that the government didn't give access to, to, to international teams and, and restricted border access for a long period of time I, to Northwest Syria. You know, from your perspective, being on the ground in Turkey, do you think that was a, something that could pose a challenge to, to future operations around the world? Yes, yeah. This time uh, we went to Turkey and first we rescued uh, two people in ha at the Yemen. And then afterwards, we, we heard the news that uh, they are they, from North, Northwest Syria, they, they need help in the province of Hatay. So we try to uh, communicate with the government, see if we can access into the area. Uh, but finally, because uh, the military, even the military, they are, they were hard to get into the area. So uh, we are not able to get ac access to the area. Yeah, so how we, does that impact your team? I mean, your team's on the ground, you want to go somewhere, you're not able to because of an access issue to get in there. Does that have an impact on your on individuals who are responding into a, an insecure environment? Are they frustrated? Were they unhappy with this situation? Or is this something that, that international search and rescue workers are, just have to have to get used to? Yeah, no, because uh, we still have a lot of work in other Yaman. Yeah, but of course, we if we can go, we will try our best. Yeah. So, it needs so let's to, talk a lot about the limitations. I mean, we talked about access, but there's a lot of other limitations. And the Red Book for EMT teams lists a ton of limitations. What do you think are the, the key challenges, the key limitations that might be faced by search and rescue teams trying to deploy into places of armed conflict and, and insecure environments? Um, the, yeah, I think that uh, the limitation is that uh, we have we have to go to the area, but I think the the next it is necessary to to have the control. If the conflict is if if the area is too dangerous, we have to access, assess to decide that uh, we have to make sure that our team 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 members they will be safe into the area to do the mission. So I think that's necessary to, to have the uh, assessment, the, the control of the area if the armed conflict is, yeah. Too so dangerous. first order of magnitude is somebody has to have control and it can't, you can't be deploying into active conflict areas, it sounds like. When you're, when you're trying to assess this uh, as a organization before you're deploying and while people are deployed, how do you go about the risk mitigation and how do you do, how do you do the risk assessment itself? Is there an in-depth methodology you use? Do you borrow an existing methodology that exists out there in the world? And how do you work with your, your board and your insurer throughout this process as the risk changes? I think because our organization has established since 1981, so that's been about 42 years already. So basically, uh, we we have a lot of experience. Every time we go to the disaster area, we have the experience before, and uh, we will follow the guideline to do. And we 
we have the training and um, education of how we to, how to deal with the environment. And we have a lot of simulation of the disaster when disaster happened. So I think um, every time before we go, we have preparation. But when you do that, do you do a formal risk assessment? Do you, do you assess impact versus probability of individual risks? And do you weight those and develop a, a numeric account of, of the risk that you'll be facing? Or is it more of a, a subjective, just a discussion amongst your, your leadership? I think uh, we have a formal assessment, yes. And when you do these formal assessments, do you do these with, have, have you copied existing ones that exist from other organizations around the world or do you do your own sort of methodology? Majority we do with our own, yeah. And so when you're out and, and you're in a place like Turkey and you're interacting with other teams, do you, do you see a spectrum of experience in these environments amongst the teams? Or at this point, do the teams have about the same level of experience with these insecure environments? Um, our team member, the ratio is like uh, five veteran, maybe five or three, five to one or three to one. The veteran, they will bring the apprent apprentice, the, the novice, and somebody are well experienced. Some people are just to just new. So uh, there will be veterans uh, to teach and or to to bring the beginner or the novice to the area. Yeah. But that's within your team. But when you start interacting with other teams from other countries, do you see a, the same level of experience across the teams in these environments? Or I would, is it a wide gap? I would say that uh, different organizations, they have different spe uh, special specialists. Because uh, when we go to the area, we will see medical team, minor, army, firefighter, separate. And we have to cope with translator, construct engineer, reporter, excavator, driver, or bulldozer driver. So they are all they are all from different kind, different area of specialists. Yeah. So I I would say that we work well with, with each team. Yeah. When you talk about international classifications, you don't have a classified emergency medical team under the WHO right now, you're not on the classified team list. Have you thought about creating a, a classified team for EMT? Have you thought about getting classified uh, in other areas of, of emergency response? Yeah, that's, that's what we want. But since our country has not joined the WHO yes, so that's what we are working hard with. So let's talk about that. I mean, one of the things with the, the EMT list, there's a classified list. We've talked about how there, there could be more teams. There needs to be more teams, more diversity, right? We have Japan, we have Korea on the list. Um, we don't have a team from Taiwan. So do you feel like you have the capability to do it? It's, it's really just a, a procedural mechanism that's preventing you from being able to do that right now. I actually, we have our team members, some of them are, medical teams they were just uh we were just go together so some people have uh, professional training for the uh, emt yeah but you think but you they, can meet international so, standards if you were asked to meet the international standards you feel that you could meet them yes uh, that's what yeah no problem we already okay, so, have let, let's talk about one of the things that came up in the in a conversation we had yesterday. Um, we had Paul Spiegel on from, from Johns Hopkins University, and he was asked about the scenarios and the challenges in Asia Pacific and the ones that he thought were most challenging for contingency planning, for, for planning for future events that could happen. And he said the one that was the most difficult and the most challenging would be a situation in Taiwan where there's conflict in Taiwan. As, as a Taiwan 
humanitarian organization on the ground. How do you prepare for contingencies that that are at that level of violence and and are you concerned about the future? Yes, of course we are concerned about that. For example, uh, Taiwan and China, the rising of the conflict in political. So that's what we are prepared when we meet the conflict like that. Uh, in the future, if it happened, uh, we should be ready for that. And we talk about being ready for, for conflicts and being able to respond to natural disasters and other things that happen in the middle of a conflict. And one of the things that the White Helmet said during a talk last week was that you need to invest in domestic capacity. There has to be people in the conflict zone who are part of that community who are able to respond if there isn't access for outsiders to come in and to be able to help. Do you agree with that assessment? Do you think a more focus needs to be made on, on investing in domestic humanitarian organizations to respond to disasters when it comes to conflict? Oh, of course, yeah. We need more investment domestically, uh, but we are third party uh, non-governmental organization. So economically, uh, the financially is difficult, yeah, but we have donors, um, but we, I think that's correct that we need more investment domestically yeah, to, to enhance the uh, cap capacity for search and rescue. So after being in Turkey and seeing the situation in Syria and coming home and, and thinking about these things, where does the investment need to be made? Is it on stockpiling resources in, in countries that could be potential conflict areas in the future? Is it investing in people to be able to respond? Where, where does this investment, if you're going to focus the investment somewhere on search and rescue and emergency medical teams in places that could be potential conflict areas in the future, where do you think the focus should be on that investment? I think uh, we have to invest more about education and uh, skill training. We need a lot of um, equipment, like um, we need a lot of equipment like life detector. We have it, but, and we also have to learn how to use it. Like for example, like this time uh, we brought hanging with equipment, grinder, electric drill, gasoline barrel, stone crusher, ventilation duct, extension cord lamp, electric scissor, toolbox, uh, tape, transformer, chainsaw, whistle, X, and the uh, heavy machine, we also need an uh, excavator, truck, quadrotter, aircraft, el electric drill, shovels, hydraulic shear, and so on and so forth, board dozers. Yeah, so I think they are a lot to invest, yeah. And you've been all over the world. And one of the things that came up in a prior discussion was about regional capacity and about how the capacity around the world seems to be focused in specific regions and that there isn't equity amongst regions in terms of having the capabilities to do search and rescue and to do emergency medical team response. Is that, is that what you found in, in your own work? Have you seen that there's gaps regionally around the world between say Africa, the Pacific, um, South America, and, and say North America, Europe, and, and East Asia? Does that exist in reality? And, and have you seen that? Uh, yeah, I think there, there are gaps between different regions. So every time I think uh, we, when we do the um, international search and rescue, we share experiences. And we either learn from other team or the other team, they can learn something from us. Do you think there's a need to invest in search and rescue training for teams in places like Africa, the Pacific, and, and other areas that don't have their own teams right now? Yes, yeah, definitely. How could your organization play a role in that? 
uh, we have been to uh, other countries training, yeah, before, if they need it, and we will contact first, and if they need it, we, we also did that. Can you tell us a little bit about the countries you've been to and, and how you've how you train their their staff? Yeah, we, yes, we've been Malaysia and Nepal for uh, train training for search and rescue, and they don't have the equipment and the place. Yeah, we we were also we also construct the the building. For, for them to do in the training. So when you when you look at this experience over the last 10 years, do you see this gap increasing or stabilizing, getting smaller in terms of capabilities between the wealthier countries and the, the less wealthy countries in the world in terms of search and rescue capability? Yeah, I think the gap is increasing, but we will try the best to, to fulfill, yeah. So I wanna ask you about diversity uh, in terms of, of racial ethnic diversity in search and rescue and emergency medical teams around the world. Do you see a lot of diversity when you go to places like Turkey and Myanmar on the ground amongst the teams who are responding? Do you see enough diversity? Yes, yeah, so we have to, to know the their culture before we are lent to the place. Yeah, we have to ask the translator what, what we have to be careful about. And sometimes that to, to minimize the misunderstanding. Yeah. What, are, what do you see the key advantages to be? For, for being, I mean, you talked about that you have lots of different disasters, so you have a lot of experience. Are there any other major advantages that you see for your organization when you look at other like, like teams around the world? I think the advantage is that we face more diverse situation. I heard that uh, some country they don't have earthquake, so they might name they might never have that kind of experience. Yeah. And have you ever been able to deploy in the People's Republic of China? Have you ever have you ever gone there for for doing any work? We have never been to China because of the political. Uh, reason. And from a from a capability standpoint, is there anywhere else around the world that you you find it difficult to be able to go to, or is there are there other challenges with with politics for for your organization to be able to deploy places? I think, except China, I, we've been like most, yeah. And, and how, do, how do you get received when you show up in a place like Myanmar or Pakistan? Um, do they know where Taiwan is? Do they, do they? Is there a conversation you have, or are you just there as a another international search and rescue worker? Yeah, they know Tai. They know we are from Taiwan. And, and how how does that conversation go when you're when you're on the ground working side by side with say the the Pakistani um, local community organizations and whatnot? Do you do you maintain relationships with these organizations? Do you have long lasting or is it very transactional? Yeah, it's long lasting. For example, like this time we've been Turkey. They say we we will always be the friends of Turkey. They think us deeply, yeah. So you're familiar with all the mechanisms that exist in the UN system and the WHO system, uh, the governance models for search and rescue and emergency medical teams. Obviously, Taiwan has a difficult cha challenge in trying to be able to, to participate in those mechanisms because they, they involve the high contracting parties. What would you like to see happen 
in terms of reform of the governance model that, that governs search and rescue and emergency medical team response around the world? Yeah, every country has their own medical system. We will respect them. Yeah. But in terms of the capabilities for deploying teams like your team from search and rescue from Taiwan, there's a governance model that deploys a lot of this. So my understanding is that you, you have to self-deploy to these areas, correct? You're not deploying under the UN or under the WHO system. Yeah, we would. So, so, so would you, are you okay with that current arrangement or would you like to see that change? Of course, uh, uh, if we can, yeah, we respect them. Yeah, but of course we can, uh, yeah. So the governance model is one of the issues. Another one's capabilities. We talked about that. We talked about the gap between domestic versus international and, and having access issues to respond to places that have insecure environments. What other concerns do you have? What other challenges do you face? What have we not talked about? So far, uh, we didn't see the very huge challenges. So when we, when we talk about armed conflict environments, you don't, you don't see huge challenges being able to deploy into those places? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's one of the challenge. So um, within that challenge, are there any other challenges beside access, beside governance? Is there any other challenges that you see that make it difficult to do that? I think that's the biggest challenges. Since uh, if we cannot go to the place, we could, couldn't do our mission. Other than that, I don't see that huge challenges. Yeah. So one of the things that was brought up by other groups was that one of the challenges is that there's, a, there's an increasing lack of respect for international humanitarian law in armed conflicts around the world. Have you seen that on the ground in places you've responded? Do you, do, have you seen a change in, in the respect for international humanitarian law? Actually, most of place we go, they are very kind and very friendly to us. Yeah, so I don't see that in my experience. And does your organization take a position on independence, on impartiality and neutrality? Do you, do you as an organization, commit to remaining neutral, remaining impartial, and remaining independent at all times? Or are there situations where, for example, to get access, you might take a transportation with military to go somewhere, or you might um, see a human rights violation, so you're reported. Do you, how do you fit on the spectrum between um, those, those humanitarian principles? Yes, yeah, we are independent, but uh, we are called we cooperate with the army very well. Since that we, we are going there, uh, our mission is to help them. So we will follow respect laws of uh, local government. So you're willing to, to sacrifice some independence to be able to get access and to be able to operate. So you do work with, with militaries, but in terms of impartiality and neutrality, do you maintain impartiality and neutrality when you operate? Or are there situations where in some of these environments, you, you have to be less neutral? Yeah, we'd be neutral, I think that uh, we we won't create we, we won't make a new problem yeah we, we try to solve the problems and not make a new problem yeah so if your team sees a, a human rights violation when they're out in the field what do they do what what's the process that you've developed um 
Do they report it back to their command? What does the command do when they when they hear that there is a human rights violation in the field? How, how do you manage those sort of challenges? I think that we were reported by the most area we've been, the military, they will control the area. When, whenever disaster happens, yeah, so just, just follow and respect the laws of the local government and yeah. And has that ever been a challenge when you're in the field? Have you, have you been in situations where it's challenging, where the, the people who are giving you access might themselves be doing things that, that go against international law? I, I haven't seen that. Yeah, I, I don't have that. I don't see that situation. Yeah. So when you look out at the outlook for the future, what do you see the outlook for outside of Taiwan, for the rest of the world? What do you see the outlook for, for the response of search and rescue teams to, to armed conflicts and other insecure environments? Are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future? Yeah, I'm optimistic to see that in the future that if the search and rescue team that from different country that can share experiences and uh, can work together. Yeah, I, I'm more optimistic, yeah. And when it comes to preparedness for, for future disasters in Taiwan, are you optimistic or pessimistic that the international community is going to do more to, to help with preparation and response in Taiwan? I'm optimistic, yeah. And, we, and how would that happen in practice? What what do you what do you see happening right now that makes you optimistic about the future and about the ability if there was a disaster and if there was some sort of conflict ongoing with the People's Republic of China when that happened, that the international community would still be able to get access and still be able to help Taiwan? What makes you optimistic? Since that we train hard regularly. So, uh, and we try to keep improve our skill set and equipment. Yeah, so we're working hard on it. But do you think that you have enough capacity yourself in Taiwan to be able to, to handle a major earthquake or something if there was an ongoing conflict with, with, a, with a third party? Or would you need would you need to have international teams come in to be able to assist in a situation like you just saw in, in northwest Syria? Yeah, of course we welcome if the uh, rescue team from everywhere from from the war. Yeah, we we are welcome if the. the but are you disaster. optimistic that they'll have access, or, or are you concerned that they might there might be challenges with with them gaining access? The change maybe be the political reason if the uh, Republic of China, People's Republic of China, they they won't allow. Yes, that's what we we faced before. Some and are you prepared? Are, are you prepared for that situation in Taiwan? Or do you feel like if 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 PRC did block access and said? international teams couldn't come in to help with an earthquake and blockaded Taiwan and made it impossible for them to do that. Do you have the capacity in Taiwan to be able to manage a crisis of that scale yourself? Yeah, I think we have the capacity of doing that. What would be the consequence for the people of Taiwan if that happened? What would, what would be the outcome? Would it be a, would it be a, a worse outcome for the people of Taiwan if international teams weren't given access? Uh, I think we have enough capacity that for example, my team have about 100 branches. So I think that's enough. We have that capacity to deal with that. Of course, the 
the more people, the more rescue team come, can come is the, the best. And then when you look out at, at other places around the world and you look at the future, where do you see growth for your organization? Where do you see the ability for you to play a bigger role in international search and rescue response? Is it within Asia or are you looking beyond Asia at this point? Yeah, I think we can do great uh, in South, Southeast Asia. We have to keep improving ourselves and to help uh, if the some rescue team they they have haven't haven't developed yet yeah my last question i mean you you came back from turkey and you've been in all of these places around the world some challenging environments what are the areas that you're hoping to grow skills and knowledge for your team what what, what are the areas of new focus or expansion for search and rescue how is search and rescue changing as a result of responding to these armed conflicts and insecure environments Um, you mean which country or? Uh, no, I'm talking about actual skills and, and capabilities. There, there's been a discussion about how search and rescue teams are being asked to do more and that they have to have new skills and new capabilities and have to be able to stay on site longer than just 72 hours. So so how is how is that affecting your organization? Do you see the need for new skills and new training? And are you expanding the services you're offering uh, to 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 communities that are impacted by by these disasters and armed conflicts. Uh, I think the, I we, we didn't see that yet, but I think that it's more important. Like for example, this time in Turkey, we saved one person last uh, about one hundred ninety eight hours after. So I think 72 hours might not be too short. There are more people being rescued after more than 200 hours. Yeah, so I think that's more important than skill. So the time is, is extending longer now. You have to have the ability to stay on site longer. How does that affect your operations? We have to have faith. Yeah, to faith, to believe that let's hope that we can rescue more. So it seems like there's a mental health dynamic to it all as well. I mean, it's hope has an impact obviously on, on mental health. So how, when you deploy to these areas, how are the mental health concerns different in a traditional environment versus an armed conflict slash uh, other insecure environment? Are, are there different mental health issues that your your responders themselves face and the community that they're responding to face yeah every time before we go to the area we have preparation so we know what's going to happen and what we should have to do we have a lot of training and simulation the uncertainty is no more and how about for the families back home when you have people deployed in places like Turkey or Myanmar? I mean, they have families back home. How is their mental health when they're responding in these sort of environments and they're watching what's happening on TV? Yes, we, we will counsel with every teammates. We talk to each other. And uh, if some people, if they have like PTSD, we will recommend uh, to the professional doctors. The, uh, another way is to uh, rely on religious belief. Yeah, and we have to talk with each other and trust each other. Yes, and um, believe each other. So we'll end with this. I mean, if you could make a statement, if you were asked to give your opinion of what should change about search and rescue response in the world that we live in today with respect to armed conflicts and, and other insecure environments, what would you say needs to change? I would 
hope that uh, governments from uh, from countries uh, to be more open to the rescue team. Since uh, if we since we have to get into the area so that we we are able to help people. Well, I appreciate your time very much, and I look forward to continuing the conversation about how search and rescue teams can can better respond to to these armed conflict environments and other other types of insecure environments. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much.